Hi, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Chris Johnson. I'm the Freeman Chair in China Studies here at CSIS. Uh, thanks all, to all of you for coming. Uh, I'm really honored to be uh, hosting this panel here today at CSIS with uh, such distinguished guests and uh, very thankful to uh, Richard McGregor from the Financial Times for joining us today to moderate today's session. And I'm going to kick it over to Richard uh, to start us off. Thanks. Uh, just going to start, I mean, I think the, it's often said that if you want to get, get people to fall asleep, you simply mention the words third plenum of the 18th Central Committee. But <laughs> that in fact, if you interject then, well, what about the third plenum of the 11th Central Committee? You can wait Sorry, because that was Deng Xiaoping's uh, transformational uh, plenum. So um, uh, I want to start with something from, sorry, this is with each of the panelists. Uh, we're going to start with Doug Paul, um, formerly the NSC and uh, uh, just about everywhere we decided in science. The, um, uh, why don't you start by giving us an overview of what you think the, the, the plenum achieved? There's already a lot of uh, d d d there's already a lot of debate about that. Uh, you've got more than 140 characters, but you've, you've got to brief somebody in three to five minutes about this. Um, was it a box ticking exercise? Uh, was it as grand as some of the headlines have, uh, ha uh, have led us to believe? Um, were they going through the motions? It, give us your sense as a long time China watcher. All right. Uh, can you hear me? Thank you. Uh, First, I have to warn you, I got in last night from Beijing. <laughs> what I know is, is hot and late, but whether I really know it or have understood it is a big question right now. Uh, but this is a free to fair admitted elevator speech on this plenum. Um, if you go to China a lot or follow it closely, you would have been hearing over the last five years about pent up need for reform, whether it's in finance or uh, running the economy, political reform, judicial reform, social reform, right across the board. There was a growing sense of frustration that whatever the good start was under the previous leadership of Hu Jintao and Wen Jiapao, it had petered out the last years of their time. And it, we saw things like a more assertive foreign policy uh, exercise, growing military capabilities, uh, increasing tax uh, crackdown. Can't hear hmm. um, <laughs> Increasing crackdown um, on political dissent. Uh, a lot of uh, people who were calling for modest political reform are arrested and jailed. Uh, so there's been a pent-up need for some relook at things under the new leadership and a desire above all in the circles that I interact with to have strong leadership. And I think what we've seen uh, from this reform document is an attempt to answer the mail from the Chinese people and officials mm -hmm. with a strong demonstration of leadership and an uh, effort to get at reform. The document that was produced, which comes in six sections and 16 sub-branches and 60 items, uh, the 616, 60 just feels Chinese. <laughs> uh, um, I would not describe it as a revolutionary document. You wouldn't expect a group of people who uh, sit at the top of the Chinese system and have been arresting a lot of folks and clamping down on public dissent over the months since they've been in power, starting last November, uh, to, to do that sort of thing. But it, as a reform document, it's rather sweeping. It touches on all those categories of uh, public concern that I mentioned earlier. Um, two things that came away, just to wrap up quickly, two things that everybody wants to talk about in China are the new small group for deepening economic reform uh, at a very high level to oversee the economic and other reforms, and a new policy body on foreign and uh, domestic security. And if you read the documents carefully as they've been revealed up to now, and, and as we speak, there are expositions going on where ministers are now laying out what they understand to be their new instructions day by day that is unfolding. Uh, but if you, if you read the stuff on the new state security commission or committee, the translation keeps varying, um, you, you get the impression it's all about domestic security. And as we saw the press recently in the Uyghur accused, the alleged Uyghur attack on was it Mao Zedong's picture of Tiananmen and other things. Maybe you would think that's it's all about that. But in my private conversations in Beijing, I, I heard over and over again that it's, it's as much about that and foreign policy, even though foreign policy does not get a large 
uh, dose of the coverage in the actual document. And that may be because it's a domestic party document that we're looking at. And we'll but, but you think it's a big document, right? This is not, you, you don't this feel This is a big reform, but it's not revolutionary, is, is, is what I would characterize it as. Well, well, let's unpick some of that, starting with the economy. And Nick, starting with you, uh, um, uh, Nick's from the Peterson Institute for International Finance, a long time watcher of the Chinese economy. Uh, it's going through the document, there's all sorts of things which are listed in there. Deposit insurance, HUCO, rural land reform, interest rate reform, flexible capital account and exchange rate, private banks, local government finance. These are all incredibly familiar issues uh, for anybody who's followed the Chinese economy for any length of time. Um, I mean, was it a box ticking exercise on the economy? Is there any import in dragging together into one single document? Uh, how did you read it? Because I know you've been very critical of uh, you know, Chinese economic policy lagging uh, in the last government. Well, I certainly <coughs> agree with what Doug said. We saw very little economic reform. I'm not sure it ever even really petered out. They never really got started on it in the <laughs> economic domain. So we've had 10 years of very little uh, fundamental economic reform. I think this document is potentially revolutionary. Um, you could say it's box ticking, but the, the scope of what is covered in the economic domain is really unprecedented. I can't really think of anything that's, that's left off. Uh, obviously, implementation will be, be critical, so I think we're going to have to wait uh, quite a bit of time to go by before we know whether or not the potential of this document to really be revolutionary on the economic front is you know, realized or not. But I would just highlight several things. The fact that they say over and over again that markets are going to play a decisive role in the allocation of resources. I think that is a major, major change. It's an elevation of the role of the market substantially beyond anything we've ever seen before in a party document. You know, they used to talk about the, the market playing a supplemental role to the plan and things like this, but now the market is front and center and the market is to decide everything that can be decided uh, through the market. Um, I think the second, <coughs> second thing that uh, is very important is the, well, let me just say first, related to the market, obviously, very explicit discussion of price reform for the key factor prices that have been controlled by the government, whether you're talking about the interest rate, the price of land, uh, energy, and so forth, uh, water, all of those things are going to be uh, reformed. And then the second thing is uh, the significant discussion of increased competition. So I think these framing issues about having uh, markets be playing the decisive role and having more competition, a level playing field. Uh, and now some people are saying that the, you know, the, the document, the decision in particular, doesn't say very much about state-owned enterprises and where it does mention them, they say they're still gonna have a main role. But state-owned enterprises have been the main beneficiaries of underpriced capital, underpriced energy, uh, and so forth. So if, if they follow through on these reforms and if, they, if the hint about more competition implies that private uh, firms are going to play a greater role in some of the sectors where state firms are still in a very strong monopolistic or oligopolistic position, this will have a very dramatic effect on the way the economy operates. Uh, so I, those, to, those things to me are the highlight. So it, yeah. potentially revolutionary on, on the economic front. Just one follow-up question. We're going to come back in the panel to the issue of implementation more broadly, but all the sorts, you think, sorts of things you talk about, and particularly reform of pricing, I mean, this document looks like a massive defeat to ask a sort of China geeky question for the, uh, the NDRC, the sort of the old sort of state planning body, is that right? Because they're the ones which have kept many parts of the financial system uh, uh, and, and the pricing system under wraps. Well, I certainly think this is a... Con if Again, if they follow through, this will be an erosion of the role of the NDRC. And particularly, as Doug mentioned, this oversight body is, appar is apparently, well, we don't know for sure, at least I don't know for sure, maybe Doug does, is going to rank above the NDRC. So uh, I would say that this is, you know, we've gone from the Planning Commission to the State Development and Planning Commission and now the NDRC. So this is a continuation of the reduction over time in the the so sphere a, of the economy that they try to directly control. Downhill manage. slide. Um, I want to come to Chris now and to another aspect of the document, which I think maybe has got a little bit less uh, discussion in mm -hmm. the media, perhaps not in China. There's mm -hmm. two aspects to the sort of broader um, security focus of the document. There's a sort of so-called uh, Chinese NSC being set up, something which has also been discussed for years and years and years. And yeah. 
Um, you also noticed uh, what stood out for you also was the potential, the start of, uh, of a, a potentially massive reform in the way the military is structured. Right. So right. could you just drag that out of the sure, document? Sure, sure. Um, I mean, on the former, I just, I, I just like to echo what Doug said. I, I, I think that uh, people are misunderstanding the focus of this new body. It was made very clear to me when I was in Beijing that it's going to have a, a very strong focus on external as well. Um, and that the, while that part is not being particularly publicized, it has been interesting. You get the sense that there may be some friction actually within the system over the writ uh, of this thing because it, it was initially translated into English as State Security Committee, even though of course the Chinese is the same that they use to describe the U.S. and Russian National Security Councils. Uh, and the Foreign Ministry was very quick to come out and say that it was focused on extremists, terrorists, and, and uh, separatists. And so they seem to be trying to define uh, its focus as very much domestic. And then very interestingly, when the, when the full plenum decision was released, and more importantly, Xi Jinping's companion explanation, in there, interestingly, suddenly there was a lot more talk about the international mm -hmm. role of it. And also now the English translation seems, seems to have shifted to National Security Commission, although it does seem to be bouncing around uh, in, in the central media. But, but what are they trying to do that that they're not doing now? I mean, well, what, what does body do? coordination is, is going to be the key. I mean, this has been a fundamental issue now for some time. They've been talking about this for two decades. Uh, they know they need it. I think that the fundamental driver in this case is Xi Jinping has been able, on the economic side, also on this side, to be able to argue that there is a pressing sense of need that has not existed uh, previously uh, in all of these areas for better coordination, for some kind of supra entity that can, you know, crack the heads and so on. And if you look at what amazes me about this document and what we're seeing here is uh, Xi Jinping's mastery of political stagecraft um, and his ability to sort of line these things up in a very artful way within the system. In particular, uh, it seems to me that he started this process on at least the domestic side some time ago by removing the, uh, the Zheng Fawei system, the, the Politi Politics and Law Commission, from the Standing Committee, kicking them down a peg, going after Zhou Yongkong and the security services. There's a clear pattern you know, moving in this direction because, of course, that, that oxen is going to get gored the most. On the PLA stuff, uh, again, to me, uh, it is potentially revolutionary. We're going to have to see a lot more, but my impression is this is the most public they've ever been. This discussion has also been going on within the system for many, many years about changing the PLA's command structure away from a sort of uh, ground-focused uh, territorial defense model where the primary threat was the Soviet Union and domestic enemies, quite frankly. I mean, that's what a military region system is designed to do. If they go toward this operational theater, it's going to be externally focused with a much heavier emphasis on joint command. And what's really interesting is how they're, in the document anyway, how they're marrying those two concepts. So there will be a, a joint command system at the CMC, Central Military Commission level, companion with these war zones um, at the theater level. And it's a fundamental change. They will have to massively downsize the military, especially the army, uh, and you'll lose a lot of general officer billets uh, in that process. And also it will make them a much more capable fighting force if they're able to execute. Uh, you know, they have the hardware piece. They've made tremendous strides in the, in the last decade plus. I think it's fair to say on the software side, their ability to do command and control, uh, combined drilling operations and so on, has been lagging. This, if they follow through on it, will be substantial. And it's also the first time that I can recall that any plenum document has mentioned major military reform in a very long time. So it's like the economy in some respect, all sorts of things they might have wanted to do have been right. massively accelerated. Yes, exactly. Um, now, of mm. course, there were two documents. There was an initial vague communique, then there was the 21,000 character document, so-called The Decision, which came out. It made it sound like a John Grisham novel or something. Um, the, uh, uh, and it, 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 goes, it goes far beyond just the sort of uh, your meat and potatoes, macroeconomic reform, uh, the kind of military and security issues. Um, and there's all sorts of other things that, uh, Robert, you wanted to talk about. I should introduce you, Robert Daly, who's the head of the, uh, the Kissinger Institute on China and the US at the Wilson Center. Uh, the environment, uh, stuff about the rich-poor gap, uh, right. hints at uh, a, a new or expanded or slightly liberated role for NGOs. Can you tell us what you took it out took out of those sort of yes? I think this is all aspects? part part of the political stagecraft that she is demonstrating his mastery of. And I think we need to look not only at the two documents you mentioned, but at some of the documents and the announcements that have preceded it, including Xi Jinping's discussion of, of Chinese history and what he called uh, the two undeniable, right. the Liangabuko Foren, in which he set up his 
uh, justification for his new reforms, which couldn't be criticized either by the people who were Maoists or, or Dungists. And he did that very cleverly. And of course, he also wrote the document that followed uh, the decision document. So we tend to focus on uh, the economic reform, the political reform, to parse out what the individual policies are going to be. But I think we also have to look at the decision document in its entirety and understand it as a public document, as propaganda, as Xi's announcement to the Chinese people, and as a piece of rhetoric. What else is in there? A tremendous amount about improving the environment in China. Uh, what they call Sheng Tai Wenming is, is throughout the document. Concern for uh, the rich poor gap. Uh, one of the phrases that actually Madame Liu Yandong has highlighted since she came here is this line that says, improving the welfare of the Chinese people is our setting off point and the point at which we land. It, it's the entire arc. Touches at great length on corruption, on issues of social justice. There are about 23 uses of the word gungping or fairness, but also gung zheng, zheng yi, justice, throughout, and a great deal of emphasis on social governance, what they call shi hui zhi li, instead of the old phrase social management. And this would seem to imply a little bit more space for participation on the part of NGOs or the, the nascent civil society organizations. That at least is the hope. Broadly speaking, I think that what she has demonstrated here is that he is in fact listening to almost all of the concerns of the common people and not just to party members. These in fact are the concerns that you find down on the street in China and he has demonstrated in contrast to his predecessor that he is actually listening. He's setting himself up not only as a strong man within the party, but very importantly as a man of the people. What they call ping yi jinren pervades the entire document. And he has also demonstrated that he's not only listening, but he's communicating. Prior to this plenum, I think very importantly, Xi Jinping himself, Li Keqiang, Yu Zhengsheng were signaling in a way that they don't usually that this was going to be a deep, comprehensive, perhaps even revolutionary document. In general, the, the party would keep its own counsel and announce what it wishes to announce in its own time and not try to manage the message which they're doing. And I think that that confidence that she is showing, that man of the people style combined with his, the strong man uh, persona that he's been projecting, makes this not just a plan, but in effect a promise, almost in the Western style. He's really staking a lot, putting all of his chips out there. And I think that for that reason, there's a lot of excitement about this in China and internationally. Perhaps some irrational exuberance, actually, because the documents <laughs> also, I think, reveal two major weaknesses uh, in, in Xi's approach. Um, yeah, well, on, that, on the point of, you know, we're talking moving from, from uh, uh, management to governance, right. uh, giving civil society much more space, I often feel this is a very, uh, two things, it's a very fuzzy in China, because obviously we're going to come to an implementation, you right. know, it's, it's the, the execution of it is radically different uh, depending on where you are. But, 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 but also the fact that it seems to be a lagging indicator, not a leading, leading indicator. It's dragged by economic reform, and, and it, it's, it's done because of economic reform, not necessarily to bolster it. I'm being a bit sure. cynical here. No, 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 you're not being cynical at all. Actually, in most of these sections of the document, as with some of the uh, wording on SOE reform, there's an attempt to sort of give with one hand and then pull back with the left, and in every paragraph, there's always the statement that, of course, this will all take place under the leadership of the Communist Party, <laughs> which, and that, which we might think is a weakness, but they would think is a strength. Mm -hmm. Well, and this, I would say, is, is one of the, the weaknesses of the plan, the plenum plan, even in Chinese terms, not because we would like to see constitutional democracy, but Xi Jinping has clearly listened to the people's uh, concerns about social justice, the rich, poor disparity, the environment, crime, corruption, but he doesn't seem to have heard their desire for more information and more participation. And this is a potentially very dangerous weakness for Xi. Even though there's a lot of talk about innovation, culture, some about education in this document, there's no sense that as more people move into the cities, they are going to have modern internationalist urbanists' demands for information. There is very little sense that Chinese now want to be participate more fully in the world. So I think that there's still a, a deaf ear, a blind spot there. And the other thing I think is missing from this document, I'd be interested in your views of it, is that I think it's, the, 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 this uh, is a comprehensive, deep, as they have said, and transformative reform in its intentions, potentially revolutionary in its effects. And yet, it doesn't contain any new vision. Mm. After these 35 right. years, it, it talks about better means and improved means yep. to the same old vision, but no sense of what is China's place in the world. Mm. What is China as an international? There seems to be, a, obviously, this is a domestic document, but China no longer has the luxury of having purely domestic documents or purely domestic policies. So there's no new vision. And this, I think, is why Bao Tong, he describes this, Xi, 
as the Mao Zedong style married to the Deng Xiaoping program. Uh, and I, I think this might be, the, and it's because yeah, he hasn't moved beyond those visions. Yeah. Um, let, let's, a couple of you have mentioned uh, Xi Jinping's stagecraft, uh, leadership, um, his ability as a politician, uh, and that of course goes to the issue of implementation. And of course, in theory, it's meant to be uh, a leadership team of Xi Jinping and Li Keqiang, we, and we, we really haven't heard much of Li Keqiang in, in recent days, and in theory, he's responsible for the, eco the, the massive economic program. So you can choose who goes first. I mean, there's been lots of grandiose headlines about uh, uh, Xi Jinping being the next Deng Xiaoping and the like, equally transformative. I mean, is he as powerful as he seems from the outside, or to use that uh, much misused phrase, is it too early to tell? <laughs> well, I've just done my week there, trying to, in every conversation, try to get a sense of that. And um, Li Keqiang is just not part of the discussion. He's not as criticized, nor noted for being absent, nor that wait, wait a week and then you see him. Nothing, just we don't know. I think a lot of people have been left by this effort of Xi Jinping to put himself forward as the missing strong man, that uh, there's no room really right now. My, my personal guess, and this is not based on anything other than experience, um, is that when we have this, the Central Economic Work Conference in December, he'll be there presiding, right. and that'll compensate for a lot of it. I don't think his position has been uh, dismissed or somehow lowered, but he'll still be there playing his role. But what they want to convey is strength and leadership and, and incontrovertibility. Mm. And this came before the document. This, this, earlier in the year, we had some unprecedented film coverage on TV of Politburo meetings and things where um, Xi Jinping was speaking freely to the other 22 people assembled there. They were all taking notes like crazy. Uh, it was not intended to show uh, you know, a dynamic group interaction. <coughs> a top-down kind of structure, I think that's conveyed pretty well in the document. And Chris, what's your, what's your view on that? Uh, on Li Keqiang? Yeah. No, yeah. no on, on Xi Jinping. Oh, whether, on Xi Jinping. Whether he's as powerful. I mean, he, we, uh, whether he's he as over, powerful. He took over the military immediately, unlike uh, yeah. uh, um, uh, Hu Jintao, Hu, for example. I, I think he's, a, he's pretty quickly emerging as certainly the most powerful top leader in some time. And I, I would just echo what Doug just said in terms of, I think what's going on with Li Keqiang is not says nothing really about Li Keqiang's position or power. And in fact, uh, you know, my sense is there's no daylight necessarily between the two of them. That's what a lot of people are speculating. It's rather that he's the decider, everybody else, even the number two in the system, is an implementer. Uh, and I, I think that's a, a very strong message that comes through repeatedly, right from him chairing the drafting committee all the way down through. Uh, it's been some time since the, top, the number one has chaired the drafting committee of, of a plenum document, so that's really interesting. Um, also, I think we've just seen him move so quickly. What I see with him is that he has grasped the, the sort of core principle of the regime that his predecessor never did, which is you must control the key levers of power mm -hmm. to be effective inside the system. And he has moved rapidly to get the military, the security services, and the party machinery under his control, and that's very, very important. Even though, of course, uh, in, uh, over the years, the word strongman in China became Right. increasingly contradictory, Indeed. like China can't have a strong role. Right, right, right. Um, well, I think, I think his role also, frankly, gives the lie to the institutionalizing model uh, that has been so dominant in the last couple of years. Right. Uh, but that's my own sense. Um, Nick, I want to ask you on economic policy and the leadership relationships. I mean, Zhu Rongji used to infuriate Jiang Zemin, but Jiang Zemin, I think, nonetheless, let Zhu, gave him his head, uh, protected him. I'd never had that sense with uh, who and when. I mean, they were, they were nominally a leadership team, but they didn't seem to feed off each other at all or anything like that. I mean, could the fact that Xi Jinping is so powerful in the system at the moment, is so decisive, in fact, help Li Keqiang? Uh, because if he's got to get a lot done, he's going to need backing behind him. No, I, <clears throat> um, I, I agree with that hypothesis, and I don't think uh, Li has been marginalized. Uh, by the events of the last 10 days. After all, it is a party meeting. You expect a party leader to be front and center. He was right. more so than usual, but most of this document is, uh, the decision document in particular, is consistent with the, the themes that Lee has been talking about right. since, uh, since he assumed office as Quick premier comment. at the NPC last spring, and particularly the role of the market. That is something that he has championed over and over again. So I would agree that I don't see much daylight. I think I think they have the potential to be a very strong team on uh, uh, pushing the economic agenda forward. 
Well, but, uh, more a question for you than, than a comment, doesn't uh, she also potentially need Li Keqiang once they start actually implementing reforms and we know whose oxes are going to get gored and who's going to pay the price. He needs Lee to absorb some of the criticism and absorb some of the blame if things go wrong. Is that potentially part of Lee Keqiang's role as well in this strongman implementer scheme? Maybe, maybe there's some of that, but remember, she has also taken the leadership of the finance and economic leading small group, which was something Hu Jintao did, you know, passed off to Wen Jiaobao, so I thought early on that signaled that she was going to have a dominant role, at least in setting the overall tone. Now that one of the key things will be what the structure of this overall reform body is, uh, you know, who's going to be on it, uh, what role she will have in that, what role Lee will have in that, and um, I don't know how soon we'll have any visibility on that. Let's just come to one issue that a number of you mentioned in passing, and that is uh, uh, corruption, anti-corruption campaigns, um, and the, also the issue that Chris mentioned about the whether or not there's an institutionalization process going on, which in theory would undermine the party. Um, the the uh, first year uh, under Xi has seen a big anti-corruption campaign, mainly directed at the so-called, I love this term, petroleum mafia. <laughs> um, uh, and it, it seemed to me, I mean, whenever these things get going, people say, oh gosh, they're taking corruption seriously in China now. But of course, this really seemed to be uh, what Chris was saying, is this is, is this is a political move to grab the levers of power and just punish a few people on the way to make sure everybody else knew it. Mm. Um, am I being a bit cynical there? Do you think this was a real campaign? Everything I've heard uh, over the last years and I've had really good access to, this is a serious campaign. Yeah. It's a, the, the officials feel the heat from the people mm. on right. this one. But it, it can't be too Party serious. Well, I mean, where, where does it stop if it's serious? Well, what, they, what, I, what I found fascinating, and of course well, we'll have to see how the implementation occurs, was a discussion of trying to move this exercise away from the party and into the courts, mm. Mm. and to make the legal system be the, the compelling force behind yeah. getting people one after another mm. uh, for their corruption. I don't think there's necessarily a contradiction between the campaigns being serious and being selective. Right. It has to be selective uh, for reasons of capacity, if, if no other. Now, being selective, obviously, politics is going to enter in. But, it, but, it but the is, selectivity it's, doesn't mean that it isn't serious. It's not selective because, because it's capacity. It's selective because you can't, if you were really you can't serious. can't go out for everybody. Yeah, but that's no, capacity. You, you can't close down the government. No. Uh, but nor do you have the <laughs> judicial means even to go after everybody. So it, I, the selectivity of it, which is inevitably going to have a political character, I would agree. It doesn't mean that it isn't serious. Yeah, and is it, is it, a lot of it's out of their hands. Is yeah. there stuff that gets revealed by the Weibo. Right. So there's a photo of the corrupt guy doing. That's the little guys, though. Well, not always, though, because they, they found several instances where they start with the little guy, and suddenly the whole sweater starts to unravel, and they hit a big guy pretty, pretty quickly as they look at it. I, I would just echo something that that Doug said, too, on this thing with the courts. I think that's very real. I mean, it's very interesting that we've seen just in the last few days much more talk about the Shuanggui system and how they might seek to reform that. They know that this is something that's very unpopular uh, with the public and so on. So uh, embedded in this whole idea of embracing the state constitution as well and the, the legal means. I and mean, there's something cooking there. We're going to have to watch it and see, see what it's all about. So, OK. Now, reform, Deng's reform was always reform and opening. Um, it's not just about internal reform, even if this is a domestic document. Yeah. Do you see, uh, Nick, you might have some thoughts on this, this is not only about internal reform, but China continuing to open to the world. I mean, the US and many countries have been very frustrated uh, on many levels in the past 10 years on various market opening issues and the like. Um, is it an outward looking document as well as an inward looking one? Well, there's certainly some small sections of it that have an outward-looking component. <clears throat> I mean, most importantly, the Geiger Kaifang phrase is in there several times, I think. I can't remember how many times. Um, there's specific discussion about free trade zones. There's specific discussion about the negative list, which the Chinese have embraced now in their, supposedly, in the, their negotiations on a bilateral investment treaty, first with us, now probably with Europe uh, as well. Uh, and as I said before, there are hints of more competition uh, on protected sectors, which could include allowing a greater role for foreign firms in some of the monopolized uh, state sectors. Now, whether that, th that seems to be the signal that's in there. But um, I would say that it's, it's pretty positive on the international side, although it's a, it's a small segment of the, of the document. <coughs> I'd like to make a point that hasn't been made this morning, but I don't think people here would make it, but I'm hearing it a lot, and that is, that this is going to doom the state sector. The state owned enterprises have been 
put on notice that this is time to migrate into a kind of private sector. That's not the message I, I've picked up. Me neither. <laughs> People in China really think this is going to liberate some of the state of enterprises from some of their social obligations, some of the limitations that have been put on them. And they expect to come out of this much stronger. Now they acknowledge, everybody acknowledges, there are some state enterprises that ought to be allowed to go. Uh, but they refer to them as zombies mm. in, in the Japanese, the model of the state. <laughs> And they shouldn't be continued to be financed. But there's a lot of trust that they're going to come out with some world beating corporations hmm. that are hmm. state champion, championed by the state uh, through this enterprise. I, I, I totally agree with that. I would just add that I, I think that's cl very clear in this document. You know, the goal is not a fire sale of the state-owned enterprises and privatization, but rather creating competition that does indeed strengthen the state-owned enterprises. That's that's abundantly clear, <coughs> and that's really been the game plan since they started yeah. the reform and opening right. process. Um, just before we go to questions from the audience, I mean, is that we often read about how the uh, the Communist Party is, you know, is deeply worried about maintaining power, deeply worried about stability, uh, paranoid about its enemies at home and abroad and the like. Um, this document strikes me as free of a lot of that paranoia. In other words, much quite confident. Um, uh, did, do you find it a confident document? I find it a document that strives to project confidence <laughs> uh, and, and it projects it uh, fairly successfully, but I think that behind it lies the same concerns about stability and the same fairly secretive and paranoid style throughout. There's a lot of Wizard of Oz quality to this, right. and we haven't had the curtain pulled back to show <laughs> what lies behind it uh, quite yet. Because I was just going to say, this, this also, I think, really highlights the whole anti-corruption campaign piece. You know, to, to people abroad, you know, four dishes in a soup and these things sound absurd, but it, it, it identifies a problem, and that is what the common people see every day, the rapaciousness of local officialdom and so on. That's why they're the target of the campaign, and things that might sound silly to us with the numerology and, and the phraseology and so on is actually very meaningful in their system. Yeah. But when, when you talk about it being a potentially revolutionary document, that simply means that, doesn't it, that China will become a much stronger, richer, powerful country under a strong communist party, doesn't it? And it's not revolutionary in another sense. Well, this is where I say reformist, deeply reformist in its intentions, potentially revolutionary in its effects. Uh, you know, you open a window, you let in a few flies, as Deng Xiaoping said, and here you're, you're potentially blowing down one side of the house. The notion that <laughs> despite this confidence, they can control all of the outcomes or anticipate all the outcomes of these reforms, that's simply not true. It, it's going to be a, a very complex, exciting process, but I think it could be revolutionary in its effects, meaning in, in, with reference to the, the power of the Communist Party. It will have effects that they don't anticipate. Our beginnings seldom know our ends. Mm. Got a lot of work for a whole range of China watchers. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> but that is a very important underlying element to it is that throughout the document, I see places where they're effectively saying, we realize we've been, to use football terminology, scoring own goals in a number of these areas, and we're going to stop doing that. You know, now, obviously, implementation will be the key. They have to fix these problems. But if they're successful, they will be much more capable and powerful yeah. and influential. Okay, so going to, I think, about time for questions, is it? Um, sure. Yeah. Um, anybody uh, like to ask questions? And yes, from Brazil. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Wait for the mic, please. And identify yourself. Hi, uh, my name is Claudia Trevisan, I'm a Brazilian journalist from the newspaper Estado de São Paulo. Uh, the reform seems to have a medium to long term goal, but the Chinese economy is facing now some pressuring pressing issues like the shadow bank expansion, the inflated housing market, uh, the overinvestment. Like, how this reform is related to these issues, and how concerned are you with them? Thank you. Nick, do you want to try that? Well, I, um, I think if they carry through on some of the things that they talked about, some of these pressing issues will, will uh, recede in, uh, in, in various ways. For example, if they liberalize de domestic deposit rates, banks are going to have to pay more to depositors. The banks are paying more to wealth management products, uh, so we know there's upward pressure on deposit rates. A lot of that will get passed along to borrowers, uh, so the real cost of capital will go up. And one of the reasons that uh, investment has gone up so much in the last decade is that the real cost of capital has gone down quite a bit compared to what it was in the 90s or the first part of the last decade. So. That will, and that's very important because most investment these days is being undertaken by private firms, and they're very sensitive to the cost of capital. So if you 
you liberalize deposit rates, interest rates will go up on the lending side, and investment will go down uh, as a share of GDP. And similarly, you'll get a structural shift. Um, the industrial sector is very capital intensive. It's enjoyed the subsidy of cheap capital for a decade. Uh, when that starts to phase out, the service sector will do much better uh, because it doesn't rely on capital so much. <clears throat> so it'll grow faster, it employs more people, wages are higher in the service sector than in manufacturing. So that'll contribute to a growth of the wage share of GDP. That will lead to more consumption, which can help to offset the decline in investment and still keep the economy going. So there are a lot of aspects of the reform that will uh, address some of these underlying problems. I'd like to just add to what Nick has said by saying um, there's, this is intimately connected to uh, regional local finance mechanisms as well. You know, they've been used, they're really in trouble in the, in the local parts of the country because their income is not equal to the mandates they have to provide services, take care of housing, and all of that. Mm -hmm. And there's going to be a big shift in income from the center to the, to the provinces and the localities um, right out of the fiscal uh, uh, accounts. But they're also going to try to use these various mechanisms that Nick's outlined to try to strengthen the local economic health of the fiscal system so that there's less demand on the center for that kind of uh, support. So this is really deep running stuff. And it, I've been trying to say, contrast my colleagues up here, but I think this is a, a document with reform intent, not revolutionary intent. But when you get down to how the local officials raise money and allocate access to land to put properties up, mm -hmm. uh, you're potentially denying these very officials the income they get from the transaction, right. uh, the rent seeking that goes on at the local level. That could change the way cadres perform mm. and, and the relationship between the cadre and the people as opposed to the cadre and the party. So there's a lot that's really bubbling below the surface that could come through if the uh, surface cracks a bit. There, and yes, the microphone. And please state your name, I, I should have said before. Uh, John Verano, Covington and Burling. Uh, question regarding the anti-corruption campaign. How do you expect foreign companies to fare in that? Will they be a particular focus or just sort of part of a, a uh, level playing field focus? <laughs> well, there has been a particular focus over the past year, uh, not just the campaign against foreign companies from, from the government side, but in, in the media as well. There, there's, there have been against Starbucks and others uh, a whole series of accusations. I think it's going to be uh, incumbent upon foreign companies to, to, to wait and to watch a process of reform that is going to probably be one step forward, two steps back. There are going to be demonstration projects. There are going to be laws and quasi-laws promulgated and withdrawn. And there are also going to be, as there always are in China, this, uh, in Chinese they say, the, the, there will be policies, and then there will be the local response and the corporate responses to those policies that attempt to get around them. And that is something that the foreign companies are going to have to try to respond to, and if move, move too quickly, could easily get caught up in, in corrupt practices. I, it's going to be even tougher for us to, to know what the environment is over the next few years as this shakes down. Um, my advice to foreign invested corporates in China would be to uh, engage proactively with internal counsel. Mm -hmm. uh, make sure that you're done things well within the boundaries of the law as we understand it, rather than out here on the Correct. edge, because mm -hmm. those people on the edge are going to be feeling uh, pretty on. uncomfortable. Thank you. Uh, Jane Tom from Taishi Media. Um, first question is for Bao, uh, Mr. Bao. Um, since you just came back from Beijing, is there, do you think there's any misunderstanding or something that you need to cl clarify for um, Washington? And uh, second of all, for four of uh, expert, uh, since um, Ambassador Gary is um, resigned next year, earlier next year, and what kind of uh, successor do you think Mr. Obama should look for? Especially he got a, a lot of impact on China for his work ethic. And who do you think he can take this job and maybe help to build a major uh, big country relationship? I'm sure, we could arrange some pictures of Doug in a Starbucks uh, somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't carry my own bag first. Um, <laughs> no, the, uh, the question you asked me is something I, I don't think people here uh, 
and we haven't discussed really that much about the, the role of the National Security Council. I think it's going to make a big difference. Yeah. Um, the, one of the things that China confronts in the 21st century institutionally that it needs to fix is the fact that the military operates in one people, one system, and the foreign, op foreign policy apparatus is a whole host, starting with the foreign ministry, but Ministry of Commerce and all the big trading firms and all these, is a mess on the, on the foreign policy side. And the military, which has, is, moves with one voice from the top, and they don't interact, they don't talk to each other before things happen. Let's go back to the example, the famous example of shooting down an anti a satellite, creating an international furor, and the foreign ministry was left with nothing to say for several days. Um, I don't think they want that to happen again. They're going to try to create a mechanism. That mechanism, I believe, logically must reside above the foreign ministry and above the, the foreign affairs office of the central committee, which means it's probably going to be a new czar. And this is an assumption among my conversation partners about that being a policy or a member mm -hmm. presiding over the process. This is this is big change for China. For the military mm -hmm. to talk to a civilian about what they're going to do mm -hmm. is not going to come easy. In, in the Chinese system, but it's something that China, I think, institutionally can't avoid confronting, and this, this, this document sets out the mechanism to do that. Chris, do you want anything to say on that? I, I would just add to uh, to that by saying uh, that it will be interesting to watch the membership of the National Security Commission, because my sense is the PLA, of course, is quite comfortable in the CMC, where, <laughs> where there's 10 of them and one of <laughs> with shiny things and one person without them, right? You know, and. Uh, and so I would assume that a serious deal has been made. So I would expect to see some senior PLA officers serving in high positions in the, in the commission. I actually think it's going to be probably possibly chaired by a standing committee member, because if it is commission level, uh, that means it's a dashed line you know, off of the, at least the Politburo, maybe the standing committee. So we'll have to watch structurally where it sits. But I agree with Doug, it will be very important. And those first few conversations are going to be awkward between that, that civilian person and his military counterparts. Um, uh, anybody got any comment on a replacement for Mr. Locke? I don't know whether we can say anything. Anybody want the job? Yeah. <laughs> Raise your hand. Okay. Over, over here, front row. Where's the, yeah, there we go. Here. Hi, my name is Mike Mazur, most recently with US Army Pacific and now a consultant. I'd like to ask you about a particular thing that intrigues me. How is the Communist Party, the 60 or 70 million people, going to recruit, nurture, and promote the next generation of party members, both rank and file, middle managers, and more importantly, looking forward 10 or 15 years to the leadership as they give up control over uh, the economy and liberalize, move to market forces. All the elites that are going to arise all over China, small and medium businesses, the presidents of small companies, presidents of banks and large companies, aren't going to come through the party structure anymore. And how is the party going to lead when a large segment of Chinese society is going to grow up outside party confines. And mm -hmm. do you see them starting to recruit these sorts of people into the party at the bottom level? I think we're up to 80 million now, actually. <laughs> um, Robert, do you want to have a yeah, First, it's great to see you, Mike. Uh -huh. to see you. Uh, so far, I think they're still recruiting very successfully with getting top university graduates uh, from out the country, most of whom want to go into the civil service, into the party apparatus, as soon as they possibly can. Much of what's in this document, these changes, it's still highly aspirational. And for now, and I would think for some time to come, there's still going to be a strong belief that jobs within the party are going to be, one, the most stable. They're going to remain very, very prestigious, whatever the content might be. And there are still going to be various opportunities to uh, enrich yourself, or at least if, if not to get rich, to do relatively well. And so having worked and continuing to work closely with Chinese graduate students, this remains more than ever uh, the place that they want to go. They have family pressure, social pressure, pressure from their uh, faculty members to do precisely this. I, I wouldn't see that changing soon. I think they're on pretty solid ground. Thank you for that question, Mike. It's a good one. Um, I think the words I carry away are think Singapore. <laughs> you know, recruitment of elites, co-optation of potential dissidents, um, uh, and emphasis on quality. I did hear very explicitly uh, that the, the people who were promoted under Jiang Zemin because they were rich Mm. are not going to get promoted because they're rich and they're not going to be kept around really. Mm. Uh, but, but, but entrepreneurs are still encouraged, the rich people are still encouraged to become party members though. I've, I've heard that, that is not uh, where they want to go. Oh really? Mm. Mm. Interesting. Okay. There? Second row there? <coughs> yeah. 
Hey, good morning. My name is Jorge Guajardo. I'm with McLarty Associates. And I wanted to ask a question regarding this narrative of Xi Jinping being the strong man uh, in the Deng Xiaoping model. Uh, to my knowledge, he's the first uh, Chinese president that has to govern with two living uh, former presidents, a number of former premiers, and all the interests they represent. How does this strengthen him or weaken him? I'd like to hear your opinion. Thank you. Chris, I'll take a stab at it. Uh, I, I think that fundamentally what's interesting to watch about what's happened in that space is that when his predecessor, Hu Jintao, came in, he never got rid of his predecessor. <laughs> uh, Xi Jinping and Jiang Zemin quite clearly have come to an accommodation. I think that's seen in a number of ways throughout the system. I think Jiang still is influential within the system, uh, but it's interesting how some of these corruption investigations have been sniffing around the broad coterie of, of, of his, uh, fa his interest group within the system. Uh, Hu Jintao is virtually invisible uh, mm -hmm. since stepping down. Uh, and although it's interesting, much of what Xi Jinping is doing in this document, a lot of that was talked about during Hu Jintao's uh, uh, administration. And in fact, some of it came from, from Hu himself. He just wasn't successful in implementing it. And Xi Jinping is trying to be more successful. So I think that's true. I, the, the, the worst example of what you were, are talking about happened really in the run-up to the last party Congress. You know, they allow all of those former standing committee members to have a say in terms of who's going to be the new promotee and, and so on. It creates a tremendous logjam. Uh, you know, now there is no recognized arbiter, a la Deng Xiaoping, uh, who can cut the knot. And so they have to go through round after round after round of this stuff, and then sometimes they have to come up with uh, ways to uh, destabilize certain competing interest groups and so on. So uh, it's going to be more dynamic, I think. But I also think she's going to try to, t uh, to sort of um, trim the number of people who are involved in those discussions going forward. And I think he has a consensus among several retired people to do so. I've got two, ob <coughs> two observations on that. One, the esoteric communication to me is extremely clear, and that is you know, appearances on stages and the like. Um, none of those old leaders were on the stage for yeah. this meeting. They, they were acknowledged in the document as having been present in the audience. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So that's a big step down from where they were just in last November. Um, that suggests to me something very strong about his relationship to former major power holders. Secondly, he has really infiltrated um, the central government uh, with people who are very personal and close to him. Mm -hmm. I, I could go down a long list of people who have, who have taken important uh, responsibilities in the last year who went to school with him or had long-standing connections or intimately trusted by Xi Jinping. You can just see that his influence has been uh, placed in, in an important node of power uh, in the system. Robert? Also, uh, as Chris has alluded to several times, the emergence of Xi as a strong man, this isn't simply something that he's imposing. There's a demand for this. It's a, it's a response to, to both elite demands and demands at the street level. And this notion of a strong man, the sort of Changren, it's different than the cult of personality. You said that this was, you know, that there had been a lot of statements opposing strong man in China. There is a lot of reticence about a cult of personality, a la Mao, but the strong man per se responding to a demand, I, I think he's a, he's stands in pretty good stead with the party and the people right now. Okay, in the wait, the second row there. Hi, my name is Tenzin Kunsang, and uh, my question is about the implication of the Third Plenum on regions like Tibet, especially uh, with regards to domestic and foreign NGOs. Just wondering if the implications are different for the domestic and the foreign NGOs. So, yeah, domestic and foreign NGOs? Well, there, there's, there's very little about uh, nationalities in the plenum documents except the usual boilerplate about representing all of the nationalities of China, and there would appear to be very little concern for these questions. I, I think that the implications, not so much of the plenum itself, but of the past year, uh, would be that there won't be much space for domestic or foreign NGOs uh, operating in Tibet or in Xinjiang or other sensitive areas. I'd be quite pessimistic about that. I attended a conference on philanthropy in China last week, and all the key people in this area were there. And I didn't hear a word on uh, the new scope for NGOs uh, anything like that. And, and I was surprised what Robert said about the, the history of the last year where the, where the institution is enforcing itself and trying to uh, prevent um, alternative sources of societal organization and power from emerging mm -hmm. in the party. Yes, sorry. The second row there. Uh, 
uh, Peter Sharfman, Minor Corporation. Uh, you spoke of the uh, changes in the organizational structure to deal with the external word, world. Was there any hint of a change in the substance of external policy? Um, I don't want to. Go ahead. Um, there is, it's, it's not in the document. But prior to the publication of the document, there was an important party meeting, shared again by Xi Jinping, in which he talked about peripheral policy of China. And um, I, I outlined this for a friend who said, well, I was at the meeting, but I didn't see you there. You <laughs> seem to have gotten it. And that is, uh, they, they've announced uh, what they're trying to do is to start over again, re reset the relationship with their neighbors that went wrong the last five years. Um, Chris said earlier, scoring own goals. Well, that was really true uh, throughout the, the regional uh, powers uh, joined in China. Uh, and the China have now realized they've got to fix it. And we saw this effort to improve behavior began early. When Obama couldn't go to Southeast Asia, and we sort of didn't pay attention to it, but let me tell you, the Chinese were all over Southeast Asia with offers of new diplomatic outreach and economic support, uh, the new Asian ASEAN infrastructure bank, which I think is going to be extremely important in short order. Uh, so there's a new effort across the board to improve foreign policy, and um, significant adjustments in how they're dealing with countries like Japan and Philippines and Vietnam, where they kind of the toughness that's been showing to the Norwegians over the Nobel Peace Prize for the last few years is going to be replaced with a much more targeted effort to really isolate Abe in Japan or isolate the Philippine leadership and try to tell the people of Japan and the people of the Philippines that the Chinese are their friends. But how this will play out remains to be seen. That's the message that we started up about a month and a half ago. Was the initial announcement of just $100,000 for the Philippines after the typhoon, was that a... Was that a uh, an own goal. <laughs> this, is, this is the media at work. I, people don't follow China enough to understand there's a pace to these things. Yeah. I mean, we spend $100,000 because ambassadors all have $100,000 funds. That's, you know, that's his right to do right away to show concern. No, but they corrected it. They had a very small amount and well, there was the an outcry. Yeah. And then we were then moving up. We were escalating what we offered and others were escalating what they offered because our system's a little more responsive. The Chinese system sort of followed its normal pattern where they came up with $1.2 million worth of RMB, I think it was, mm -hmm. uh, about a week later. I'm told the Chinese offered the Philippines the Peace Arc, this 300-bed uh, hospital ship, uh, quite a while back. It took the Philippines a long time to respond. Mm -hmm. And so as soon as the Philippine response came in earlier this week, the Chinese released the ship again. So I think that we're just talking about a system that operates a little differently. And a lot of the journalism is that, well, these people, they're trying to stick it to the Filipinos. But, but isn't, the, isn't that entirely the point? The system has to operate more quickly. I think that's the point of the structural changes they're trying to make. But the way the system is now, I think we saw it play out at the usual pace. I, I just would add uh, one point on the foreign policy question. I think what's interesting about this conference that Doug referenced is that uh, my understanding is there was one held immediately after the establishment of the regime, and there hasn't been one held since then. So uh, it's quite significant. And we see Xi Jinping doing this in a number of places, kind of going back to touchstone events and redoing them in his own style. Um, that's a very interesting thing that we see him doing. I also think that because of the pressures of the leadership transition uh, last year, the Bo Lai affair, all of that stacked up together, they never really took the time to sit down and do a fundamental assessment, uh, in particular, of what the U.S. strategic rebalance means for their external security environment. Um, Hu Jintao, the departing president, didn't want to tie the hands of his successor. Xi Jinping, as the understudy, wasn't about to stick his hand up and define a new, you know, a new policy. So now that they're past all of that, my sense is meetings are beginning to occur where they're looking at this much more carefully. And if you look at things such as the preference of the most recent defense white paper, where they again acknowledge that China is in this period of strategic opportunity that runs through 2020, but they're also saying that that period of strategic opportunity is under unprecedented stress and they blame the rebalance effectively for that unprecedented stress. So that's an interesting thread to watch going forward to see how that might get pulled. So I want to go, well, we go here first, yeah. Looking up the back, there was nobody up the back with their hands up. Uh, thank you. I'm Dan O'Flaherty with the National Foreign Trade Council. Um, and I apologize, I came in a few minutes late, so this may have been addressed, but uh, I'm wondering if you see in this document uh, any a change in the mercantilist policies, such as indigenous innovation and other other uh, um, constraints on on uh, uh, foreign investors. 
Well, <clears throat> I, think, I think what's in the document is a continuation of what we've been hearing about for months. Uh, they're talking about uh, more flexibility on the currency. They're talking about more liberalization of capital inflows and outflows. They're specifically talking about two-way flows. So they're still welcoming investment into China, but they want to invest more abroad. And obviously, they're signaling things about that. If you, then if you look at the document that the People's Bank put out the other day, kind of as Doug mentioned, every ministry is now putting out its gloss on you know, what this means for our, for our domain. Uh, th there was a very, very clear statement quoting Governor Joe about the, the goal of reducing the degree of intervention in the foreign exchange market, have, having a much more market determined uh, exchange rate. So kind of filling in some of the blanks that weren't in the, in the, weren't in the decision document itself, which was not, not that detailed, at least uh, as I mentioned before, the international aspects are covered uh, you know, with, with re relatively short amount, of, small amount of space. <coughs> so. Uh, I think it's basically positive, um, and but a continuation, not a discontinuity, a continuation of the direction that they've been moving in uh, over the last several years. I want to ask you about the one, you talked about Governor Joe, one of the great survivors. He's been kept on beyond retirement age, I think. Uh, what, what does that tell you? Well, I think, you know, the, the decision to keep him on last spring, uh, uh, you know, just before the NPC, I think was uh, a very important one. I think it was a recognition of his role domestically. He, I think he's managed the central bank very well. Uh, monetary policy has been, uh, you know, been a lot of stress, a lot of international stress, but uh, China has done very well. And I think it's also a recognition of the role that he has internationally, uh, you know, representing yeah. China, uh, you know, in meetings of, uh, Treasury and finance ministers uh, around the world, and uh, you know IMF, World Bank meetings, and things like that. So I'm expecting him to not step down until uh, five years. Mm -hmm. I mean, at the at the end of the five-year period. Mm. And the plan he's laid out really requires someone like right. him to implement it <laughs> right. exactly. during that period. Do you want to go up the back, right up the back there? You fight. You two fight it out there. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Daniel Mauro, Johns Hopkins says, uh, the question is, this morning you are describing China as a, in some way a positive example of transition. And I would ask you, what about Russia? Why the transition in Russia apparently is not working as China? And what is the impact, in your opinion, on the US foreign policy? Because this that you are describing is really very interesting. I would just say his name is Putin, but I think Doug has some, uh, <laughs> some comments. I, I, the, 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 um, the unwritten script, if you could sort of dip the text in acid and the, the, the written script emerges below, it would be don't do what uh, Gorbachev did with perestroika. Right, right. It's all about don't do perestroika. You know? Toughen everything up, discipline, strong leadership, suppress dissent, no, get real control over the internet and all these other things potential sources of interference in order to carry out the reforms that are needed. I think they've studied this to death in <laughs> the last some. few years, <laughs> and it's, it's the, uh, the unspoken agenda. And the second man up the back there, yep. OK, I Ken Wen from TVA. Uh, Xi Jinping, he's talking about Chinese dream. But from this document, it looks, it looks like uh, from economic, they're going to go to the extreme right. And from political side, they go to extreme to the left. And if this happens continuing, uh, they do the economic without politics, right? How do this Chinese dream ever come true? Okay. It sounds right and left very loaded in China. Yeah. Um, Robert, do you yes, want to go this with that? is right. Uh, the China dream, of course, it, it's still very vague. And uh, this language is being mimicked not only in, in China and often in the United States. Uh, as though this were a, a serious form of discourse. And I must say, for me so far, I find a lot of this dream, dream, dreamer talk, what is your China dream? It may get flushed out, but it seems kind of infantile. Um, <laughs> but, on the the of the, yeah. <laughs> but on the question of this, uh, Zuo, Jing Yo, is, is this sustainable? I think that, that this is the contradiction that, that hasn't been resolved by Xi Jinping. Can you really tighten down politically, tighten down on communication, tighten down on information while modernizing, while creating national champions, while uh, developing worthwhile patents, while having an innovative society. 
I think that the answer is that uh, they probably cannot. There's room at the margins to, to develop for a while. But over the long term, probably not. And, and there's no evidence in these documents that they see this. Mm. Say there's, there's a lack of vision, and there's no attempt here to really take on modernity in its totality. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's very clear that they still see modernity, as Dung did, as consisting mm -hmm. of increases in standards of living and increases in level of technology. But do you mean modernity is essentially Inclusive. genuine political reform? Modern, integrated, open institutions uh, <laughs> and uh, free flow of information and, and more innovative educational uh, Constitutionalism type thing. Mm -hmm. Well, that, that I don't want to seem to be imposing too many of the Western systems on it. I think there's a way of describing aspects of, of modernity that are essential that are not necessarily just Western, and I see no evidence that they've really started to deal with them. Again, it, it's better means to the same ends. So I was going to, Chris, I was going to say, but the contradiction that Robert talks about in theory is the inter, the eternal contradiction yeah. under reform and opening, and so far the Chinese have managed say. it. Yeah, and well, so uh, that's sort of what I was going to say, and right. I actually think the the problem may be even worse than than Robert just stated in terms of, I think they've actually convinced themselves that they mm. can do it this way for a sustained period of time, yeah. uh, and that the global financial crisis and other things tell them, you know, in their quiet moments that they have found some kind of a third way. It's the only way when I talk to rational Chinese. <laughs> <laughs> that I can square the circle of the, the imminent, con you know, the massive contradictions in those two approaches. Uh, you have to believe, you have to get into their mindset and understand that they believe they found a direction that they can do this. I, I personally, you know, I think everyone on the panel would think it's unsustainable, and even they may think it's unsustainable, but for now, they seem very convinced mm. that this is the right road. Like we said right. before. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Like Singapore is four million people. Right, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Seasons there. Yeah. Thank you, Dong Hui Yu with China Review News Agency. I have two questions. First one, uh, a couple of days ago when the National Security Advisor Susan Rice made a speech, uh, she said that uh, this is an opportunity that the United States must seize. So how? Uh, what's your uh, advice or recommendation for President Obama or even the next president? The second question is, uh, if this uh, reform plan is fully implemented, do you think it would uh, strengthen the so-called Beijing consensus or even China model? Uh, what's the implication for uh, U.S.-China relations? Thank you. <laughs> First part was political. <laughs> well, I, let me just say on the last part of the question, I think that um, you know if they follow through. Uh, on the various dimensions of the reforms that they talk about, they're going to move China much more strongly in the direction of a market economy. And uh, I'm not sure that, that we're going to be talking about a Beijing consensus. We're going to be talking about an even more market-driven economy than we've seen over the past uh, couple of decades. Um, I mean, we can talk about national champions, and there are some very strong companies emerging, but many of them are in the private sector now. Uh, you know, in the manufacturing sector, the state is almost completely faded away, with the exception of a couple of highly protected sectors. You know, state companies are only producing a fifth of output. In the manufacturing sector, 35 years ago, they were producing 100 percent. So, mm -hmm. it's it's collapsed, um, and it's all been driven by market forces. On, on the issue of opportunity for the U.S., I, uh, first I think Susan Rice's speech was a, was a fully coordinated statement of U.S. intention from the top down, and I, and I think it follows on the remarkable initiative that o Obama took earlier this year to invite Xi Jinping for a shirt sleeve conversation over two days out in California. Um, the Chinese are, are presenting us with opportunities to uh, deal with some of the things that really trouble us on the economic front. Um, and we'll have to do that, you know, pardon the pun, bit by bit. <laughs> on the investment treaty and other things uh, we'll have to move forward on. And the, the, the test for America is whether we can sustain our end of the, the work on this. Uh, we've got leaders who are being driven to all ends of the world besides Asia. Fortunately, it's still scheduled that Vice President Biden will be in China in a, in a couple weeks. Um, um, and uh, we've just had uh, Jack Lew there, uh, and the Joint Commission on Commerce and Trade is due up next month. Uh, so there's a, already a lot of interaction. The question is maintaining some direction on the American side so that we can keep China moving toward what I hope will be uh, reforms that will fit, I guess, <laughs> take China toward where 
this reform overlap with the requirements that are of a, of a new era of trade between us that will be, I hope, identified within the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement, and that China will prepare itself to be a full-fledged member of that Trans-Pacific Partnership, not today and tomorrow, but a few years out when it's gotten through some of these reforms. So there's a lot of potential, but there's, again, there are lots of places where you can step on a banana skin and it's going to be a trouble. Robert? I would agree with Doug that this is going to happen bit by bit, uh, and it's going to be an unfolding as opposed to what some seem to be calling for with this new model of major power relations, having a master plan. Mm -hmm. uh, both sides are sort of crossing the river by feeling for the stones. It's, it's going to happen as, as Doug describes. In terms of this new, new major power relationship, obviously it expresses both sides' desire to avoid major conflict, to avoid the Thucydides trap. But other than that negative content, it doesn't have very much positive content. So I think it will be either we already have a new type of major power relationship or we never will, and we're going to figure it out as we move forward. <laughs> yes, on that point, of, in my Twitter feed in the last few days, I keep seeing the uh, NTGPR cropping up, and it took mm -hmm. me a long time yeah. to work it out. It's a new theory of great power The relations. acronym is, but it's now the new model of it's major power major relations. Country. Okay, for Twitter, yeah. oh, major country, country sometimes. Relations. Sometimes yeah. it's a country. Okay, well, yeah. I've got NT the Chinese is the same. Um, <laughs> so, but, I mean, uh, uh, that's, that's a Chinese form of words, isn't it? I'm not yes. sure that the U.S. has bought into that, have they? We haven't initially, we haven't formally, but uh, uh, Ms. Rice came quite close the Very other day. Close. She says, opera working to operationalize a new form of major country relations. That's right. So what, what, what does that mean in practice? I mean, this is question. Very little. This is, this, it's, <laughs> she said operationalize it. She said work together when we can, but be clear about our goals. And it's, as, as you imply, this is a Chinese exercise. We don't christen or name our relationships prescriptively. Uh, we've, some, every once in a while, as with the special relationship, we will do it retroactively as a description, but it's not formalized. So this very mode of, of naming this aspirationally and then filling it in, I think this is, is, is foreign to us. And it's not that we don't share the starting point of wanting to avoid conflict, but I'm not confident that the many discussions about this are going to yield what the Chinese side would see as real fruit as a model. And, and I think there's plenty, of, there's plenty of examples in Latin American history that they can cite. We had these empty statements about the future relationship, and we never fulfilled them. Um, I think what she was doing in this, and I think what American officials do regularly, is acknowledge that China is trying to say something right. positive about our relationship. Right. We don't reject that language. We don't identify with it, but we give it polite lip service. And right. I think that's an appropriate thing to do. Mm. Yeah. Down the front. Thank you. I'm Jin Ling Nguyen with Voice of Vietnamese Americans. I follow up with a question and ask for the, your points of view for the implications of the area, the Indo-Pacific area, um, because of the peripheral diplomacy that um, President Xi has put out to all the border uh, nations to China, especially Vietnam and the South China Sea, ASEAN, and India, Japan and South Korea, especially with Japan. Um, but whether you see the next year and the next five years, the tension would be in the area, in the maritime sovereignty between the East China Sea, the South China Sea, and all that region. Thank you. So this is a big, uh, <laughs> big deal. I, I noticed yeah. the Viet Vietnam the other day. It's another recession. <laughs> But the, but the Party Congress, uh, Hu Jintao's address to the Party Congress does, and it identifies China as a maritime power going forward for the first time in the history of the regime in an official document. So that's a very important, that's a very important statement about uh, what they're thinking. I mean, you know, this, there's this whole debate now, right, within some elements of the system. Should we be moving west, staying east, doing both? You know, uh, there's a lot of that discussion, and I think in the authoritative documents, they keep highlighting that maritime is a very important direction for them. Xi Jinping's held, I think, two Politburo study sessions on mm. this now, um, where he's made some pretty interesting remarks about the direction. And, and there's a lot that, there's a lot to see in it that's cooperative, and there's a lot to see in it that, that suggests that you know they have a game plan with regard to what they hope to accomplish in both of those areas. Yes, I'm wondering how you maritime that idea, marry the idea of the maritime power with these very difficult, sensitive relationships and sovereignty issues on both sides with six or seven nation states. Mm -hmm. I, I, I think that um, 
the leadership in Beijing has the belief, in this example of Japan, that they can keep the heat on the pot of the Senkaku Island and on the Abe government without it boiling over. Mm -hmm. They can send four to five maritime surveillance vessels and over craft, uh, overhead aircraft uh, from time to time to assert their claim on the territory, and that this will not lead to incidents that will get out of control. I think my sense is that Japanese leadership has a sense that they also can uh, manage this at a low level of tension without having to resolve it, so that you know, this will go on for a long time. If you look to the South China Sea, you know, kind of look at the geography and say, well, they've kind of used up all these places where they can start getting into strife. <laughs> so maybe we'll have a period of quiet. <laughs> raised two issues. One, one is um, China's Navy is, is kind of new. They, they were out of business for 600 years. <laughs> <laughs> And they've come back, and I can't count on them having to do Certainly do count on the Japanese military to hold Kuwait for six years. Yeah. They've, been, they've shown it for 60 years. But the, in the case of China, this is new. I, you know, accidents are very likely to happen. And secondly, uh, another a wild card is whatever the UN does. The, most of the tension yeah. over these yeah. islands has emerged uh, in the last 10 years, yeah. 15 years, has come from functions of the people who run, administer the UN law of the sea, who declare, you must tell us what your disputes are by X date. And suddenly we have disputes all over the world. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and people have to show their publics that they're acting on those disputes by deploying their armed services. Mm -hmm. So hopefully we won't have much UN activity. <laughs> Can I, can I just throw in there that, that I actually think this is the big risk, is that the top leadership does think they have a very defined flame control over this, and I don't agree at all. I, you, you have in Wu Shengli, the head of the Navy, uh, a self-described Mahanian figure. You know, it's, I, I, I think there's a lot of potential there for, for danger. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, Sam. Uh, Linton Brooks. Earlier in your, and I can't remember which one of you it was, I think it was you, Doug, you spoke of concerns and one of them was income inequality. And I heard nothing that you have described that is likely to make that better <laughs> and several things that could well make it worse. So is this a slogan they're not doing anything about? Did I misunderstand? the breadth of what they're doing, and, and if they're not really doing anything, does it matter? I mean, there are international relations theories that there comes a point of income inequality where it's seriously destabilizing. Is that, is that relevant to the discussion, and do they think it is? There was some distortion of what I heard. You said this is about incomes in China? Inequality? Inequality. Okay. Mm -hmm. There's a tremendous amount of discussion on this subject, and uh, um, I took part in a, in a big conference of all the, really the key players in China at the implementation level, not the top policy making level. Uh, and you know, the Gini coefficient, which is the word you use when you really don't understand economics, well, <laughs> uh, uh, um, it was used a lot. And people talked about it. They really need to address this problem of uh, the top 1% getting richer and richer in China and find ways to. Uh, and a lot of the discussion, therefore, then turns to. Um, both uh, empowering the, the peasantry with the land that they're right. occupying that can't really it's a big one. marketize, and uh, getting them urbanized into smaller cities and, and a whole host of things which are intended to get people into a, uh, a better position vis-a-vis -vis the structure of the national income, which they didn't make that up. No, I think, you know, when <clears throat> they don't have a progressive tax system that's going to do anything on this, and I don't think they're likely to, to implement one. There are just too few people, for example, paying an income tax. But the kind of things Doug is talking about, if you can realize the value of your assets if you're a poor peasant by being able to sell the land at a market price or get some return on the land other than just having it uh, you know, uh, stolen by government officials and then resold uh, at, at a market price, uh, that will have a very substantial effect on rural uh, incomes. Um, and so I think that would have a big effect. You know, we have a very, a very large part of this Gini coefficient is this very large gap between urban and rural. So to the extent to which you actually implement a serious reform on, uh, on land uh, ownership and, and sale rights and use rights, uh, that'll help to close that gap.
Unlikely. Who knows what the dinner is going to Well, this, I think this brings us back to a very fundamental point that Doug raised a few minutes ago as well, which is this whole issue of fiscal reform. This is, this is huge. Uh, how they manage this is going to define a lot of this. You can't do hukou loosening if you don't manage the fiscal piece right. Um, I actually think this is an area where they might have blown it. Uh, the, the, it what they're saying about the, the relationship between the center and the localities is that it's largely going to stay the same. And yet they're going to, the plans they're rolling out will deprive the localities of serious, uh, you know, forms of revenue. The land sales, uh, forcing them to move away from the local government financing vehicles and toward these, you know, bond issuances and so on. You're going to have a lot of local officials who are really worried about revenue. <coughs> and I think we could have a two to three year period while Beijing gets its ducks in a row to do the fundamental uh, fiscal reform they need to do. Um, where it could get a little bumpy uh, in, the, in the localities. I think it's a real risk. I have a different interpretation of the, of the paragraphs on fiscal, and, the, and there are some ambiguities, but they are talking about redefining central, fish, central local fiscal relations. Uh, and when you, when you look at what they're saying, I think they're talking about giving more money to the localities, so that they're going to get a larger share of the taxes that this they collect. Then giving remitting. more money, more, not more taxing power. No, more transfer payments. More transfer payments. Well, no, I think they're going to keep, you know, they're, they have all these complicated arrangements on how they share revenues from various sources. I think localities are going to get to keep a larger share. Hmm. The transfers will continue, uh, particularly to poor, poor uh, regions of China but they're going to be more regularized uh, rather than negotiated, and they're going to be less earmarked. So I think localities are mm -hmm. going to have more fiscal resources mm -hmm. than they More discretion they to spend it. Yeah. So I mean, uh, I think as Chris says, I mean, if you don't do that, this business on the land reform is never going to work. And the, uh, so they are very much interrelated. But the localities are also going to have some new obligations there, that to build a, a social safety net in particular, if they want to bring more people into the cities, there have been vague promises to have a better social safety net, somewhat yeah, funded by SOEs, but how no, does no, that finance? Most of that is being financed from the central level. The cooperative mm. health care system in the countryside is being financed almost entirely from the central government budget, right. not from localities. Mm. Yeah. And I think that's the direction they've been moving in, and I think that will continue. Mm. So, so we're going to run out of time soon. I just want to ask uh, each, uh, okay, one more question right at the back, and, and then... Uh, A uh, reporter from The Voice of America. I have two questions here. First is about uh, the anti-corruption uh, anti campaign. And earlier we were talking about the Chinese anti-corruption campaign and talk about its seriousness and it's been like selective. And I know that there is a thing uh, that the New York Times just run a story about Wen Jiabao's uh, daughter get involved in their international company. So I'm just wondering, do you think that Xi Jinping will go after Wen Jiabao or will he not, <laughs> and, uh, and, and, and why? And the second question is about the That's upcoming visit of Vice President Joe Biden to Asia. So what kind of message he's going to send to the, that, kind of, the, that area, that region? Thank you. Mm -hmm. Who wants to make, take that one? <laughs> <laughs> Isn't it a question of where she says, why would they do that? It's more, why not, isn't it? About going, about, about pursuing this issue of Wen's daughter. Well, I think there are answers to why not. It's, yeah, it's, yeah. It's, it's, it's the unraveling of the I, whole sweater. You, I, I think that the, the issue there is that the thing to watch in this space is that Xi Jinping, whatever you may conclude, happened with the Zhou Yongkang investigation. There's wide ranging views about its target and so on. Uh, seems to have defied some long-standing regime rules of physics by doing that. And so any retired Politburo Standing Committee member and their family members are going to be a little more nervous uh, than they may have been. The one family may be particularly nervous given their relationship with Xi Jinping's. A lot of princelings are not big fans of, of, of Wen Jiabao and his family. So I don't think there's any risk that they're going to be brought to book anytime soon. But um, you know, his ability to weigh in on issues, this sort of thing, maybe, maybe, uh, Dan. Um, to close, I wanted to ask each of you a question. There's all sorts of things you've each talked about in the document. If you look down, say, one, two years from now, not five years, one, two years from now, what, what, how would you benchmark the implementation uh, of this? Nick, you want to go first? Uh, well, in the economic domain, I would, my, my uh, metric would be do they get a deposit insurance scheme in, uh, in place sometime within the next year? Do they follow that up with uh, uh, interest rate liberal liberalization on the deposit side? 
and do they have what they've talked about, which is uh, quite potentially revolutionary, do they have this plan for uh, you know, winding down failing financial institutions, this Shi Chang Hua Tui Chu, you know, exit. Um, which is which is in the document and mm -hmm. has been talked about before. So that's, uh, do they have those kinds of plans for dealing with failing institutions, which means that shareholders, investors in those institutions are going to lose money. Not everyone is going to have 100% uh, government bailout, as right. uh, has been uh, so often the case in the past. So this is focusing very much on the financial center, but I think, sector, but I think that's really critical. So I think within uh, as I said, within a, within a year for the deposit insurance scheme, shortly after that, deposit rate liberalization and this, you know, what, what we call living wills for financial institutions in the U.S., which is basically what they're talking about. <laughs> Chris? Yeah, I, I just would echo real quickly on the financial sector stuff. I actually think it's, it may be one of the things we can track the most easily because it's so clear what they have to do. And, you, and as, as uh, Nick pointed out earlier, they got the right people in the jobs to be able to, to, to drive it through, so that's important. Since we talked about the military thing earlier, I, I'm not sure we're going to see any benchmarks in the next one to two years. This is going to be extraordinarily wrenching and controversial. The indicator in my mind on Joint Commando is they need to establish a, a separate Army headquarters. Um, you know, right now the, the, the green is, is the whole PLA. You know, they need to, if they establish a separate Army Service Command, then you know they're moving in a very different direction than they have historically. We really need a, a, a good CPU to sort of lay out all of the things that are in the document mm. and then that will have their own Benchmark. benchmarks and time frames involved. I assume they took the thing or one of them out, the foreign policy uh, adjustments. Um, I would expect to see rather fast. And if they don't happen fast, all the rest of it's going to get shaky because mm -hmm. it'll be a sign that there's something wrong with the authority mm -hmm. effort to implement something as important as a better coordination of the military and diplomatic activities and the related activities that China is engaged in outside China. Yeah, more broadly, I think the real test of Xi's will and skill will be whether he is clearly willing to harm some of the vested interests within two or three years. There's this attempt throughout the document to give back with the left hand what you seem to be taking away with the right and to balance while claiming that this is transformative and, and deep reform. So whether it's local governments or princelings or SOEs, it seems to me if we're going to have clear signals within about three years that he's really willing to take on some of these people, then he probably is. He's going to pick some fights. Right. Mm. And just finally, China has e evolving sort of uh, institutionalizing uh, of succession, political succession. Mm. Uh, do we think this is a 10-year term? Is that, is, that, is that for sure? I mean, it seems to have been the case with Jiang. I mean, that's uh, who yeah. and when. Is this, is this uh, have they got 10 years? Well, yeah. built into this in every conversation is he's got a, the challenges to see are coming from the five members of standing committee who are not really with him. They're on the committee, but they're not reformists of their nature. And they, they're going to be there for the duration of the five-year term. But the real opportunity for him to shine will come Seven when he can replace them yeah. after right. the next party congress. That's, that's a, a theme you hear over and over again. Yeah, and in fact, that's what's so interesting, too, about establishing these supra bodies, right? Uh, if they move some of the personnel that they're saying they're going to move from their current positions to staff that body, it creates tremendous opportunity for future Politburo level slots where he can salt his own individuals into position. And because I think that's the, his game plan. Because the standing committee will turn over in, yeah, in five yeah. years, right? Because of age restrictions, yeah. five yeah. would have to leave. Yeah. Yeah. Although even there, I mean, it's, this is one thing that's interesting. It's important to note that, you know, the party constitution actually has very few actual rules. People talk about rules. There aren't that many. They've changed the age restriction multiple times uh, to suit political expediency. So let's see what happens. Okay. On that note, thank you, uh, Nick Lardy, Chris Johnson, Doug Paul, and Robert Daly. Thank you very much. Thank you.